All right. Um, thank you, everybody, for coming to this, uh, this panel called uh, Pitfalls of Time Travel. Though, indeed, um, I, I didn't really talk to Rob about this. Um, it's, time travel is part of it. I think, uh, you know, it's not a snazzy title, but it's really time as a literary device and how you use it in different kinds of, different kinds of stories. So time travel, yeah, OK, but that's only a small piece of what you can do with time. So uh, we have uh, Jess Fink, Luke Healy, Carol Lay, and Ben Wilgus. Uh, we're going to start off that each of them are going to talk about their latest books. What I'd like for you to do is, as you're talking about the book, just talk about how you use time in, in whatever it is that, that you've done. Okay. So uh, let me see. I don't remember who's first, so we're just going to do this. Jess. <laughs> um, should I uh, just talk about We Can Fix It first? Or, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Talk, talk about the book and then talk about um, you know, how you use time in the book. OK. So uh, We Can Fix It is a time travel memoir. And um, it's a comedy, but it's also uh, there are dramatic moments. And um, I think mostly I'm using time in the book to um, talk about regret and talk about um, all of the little thoughts that like keep you awake at night, like when you said something stupid to someone that you shouldn't have said, and of course this thought is coming to you at 4 a.m. because <laughs> that's the, obviously the best time it could come to you. Um, and um, you know, instead of trying to do the obvious things, which are like you know change a big world event or stop something horrible from happening, you're you're inevitably, the things that you're going to be obsessing about in your own life are these like tiny little things that other people don't even remember. Like they don't even remember that you said that or didn't say that. And so it just felt um, like a very funny idea to me to go and like change these things that um, ultimately don't matter to anybody else but me. <laughs> <laughs> and a very, very like self-serving thing. Um, um, yeah, so that, I, that's kind of how I'm using time in the book, and I'm not really um, adhering to science fiction rules or... Um, Which we will talk about. Yes, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm more doing it in the service of comedy and um, exploring the past. Uh, Carol. I just got this book. It's on a slow boat from Asia. Um, and other boxes got lost in Alaska for some reason. But anyway, um, my time machine. This is the opposite of Jess's in that it is um, science fiction adhering more to the rules that H.G. Wells created as the first time travel story. Um, so uh, I've noticed that in, science, um, in time travel stories, you either go to the past and try to fix things, or you go to the future and try to find out what happens. And um, that's what Wells did, and, and that's what I ended up doing. Um, I used time to uh, explore my fears of the future in political unrest, climate change, and AI. You know, how are these things gonna mess with us in the future? So um, I take further and further leaps forward. And it's not a happy book. Um, it's, I explore kind of uh, the metaphysics of, of time travel, you know, like butterfly effect, grandfather effect, things like that. And um, it was, as I wrote it, I kind of surprised myself with the ending. So um, as a story, I, yeah, I, I think it, it works well. And um, I'm a little tired, so I'll pass it to the next person. <laughs> ben? Uh, so I'm, I think I'm in kind of in between the two of you. Uh, like uh, my book, this is Cronin, uh, which is a little few years old at this point. But it's also the last graphic novel I did entirely on my own, which is sort of probably the last ever, if I'm going to be honest with you. <laughs> um, <laughs> and that, so for me, for my approach to time travel, there's both like literal time travel in this in a science fiction context, but also this sort of the more travelogue sense of like the montage in comics and like having to cover 
uh, large periods of time where people are on the road and then you kind of shrink down into like a moment by moment thing. So both kinds of sort of time in comics. And for me, time travel is both the literal thing of like, I have to go to the past to fix a thing that the sort of time travel science fiction plot traditionally, but in terms of like the themes of the book, like the main character uh, is attracted to time travel and because in her context, time travel is being used uh, in a university program as a way for, un they give undergraduates access to time travel, which I don't think is a good idea, but it <laughs> does seem to me the believable thing that, yeah. you, that somebody would do uh, if they were able to do so. So all these undergraduates are using time travel to be uh, observing the past and taking notes and doing their thesis and whatnot. And uh, of course this goes horribly wrong. Uh, who could ever have seen this? Um, and the reason she's attracted to it is because she really is, she's interested in this period of history in kind of almost like a fanish way. Like she's a huge nerd about it. Uh, but then of course, like there's her vision of what this is going to be like and then there's a reality. So there's that theme of like your idea of what something is going to be versus like having to live in the reality. So there's that coming of age aspect of like, uh, wow, this sure is not what I pictured when I signed up for university, which again, uh, I feel is very relatable. And there's also, uh, this is a story about kind of transformation, like in terms of gender. And so for her, uh, going back in time, she uh, poses as a man, uh, because for her, it's like, oh, this is just practical. Like, I, the way that I present my femininity in the modern era would not work in, in this time period. So it's easier for me to just dress like a guy. That's gonna be great. Um, I invented this story when I was 25 and did not know that I was trans yet. So that's a whole other panel that we could have. <laughs> um, <laughs> But that means that like, for her, it's also that idea of escape, like this completely new context for her uh, is both very um, disorienting and challenging and difficult when she gets trapped there, but it's also very freeing because her only context here is the one that she is bringing to it on her own and these people only know her in this, in this world. And so when parts of her uh, original life in the future end up bleeding into the past, it's both a relief, like, oh my God, I'm trapped here in the past and here's somebody I know, but it also disrupts this new identity she's made for herself and she has to negotiate the kind of clash between like her current modern, con her original modern context and her current past context and how these things don't interact with each other very well. Fabulous. Great. Um, hello. Uh, so this is my uh, newest book, Self-Esteem and the End of the World. It just came out this year. And it's sort of like a satire uh, about how weird it is that we all have jobs while like climate change is happening. Mm -hmm. um, and it follows a character who's called Luke Healy, but it's fiction. And it's sort of like a fake memoir of like the next 20 years of my life from when I wrote it. <laughs> um, and it's mostly about it. So it follows um, each chapter is like five years apart. So there's no like time travel in the book, except in the, the way that we all travel through time, which is like forwards, like one minute at a time. Um, but the book is sort of about, um, it's about how like, it's, it's sort of like a coming of age story like stretched over 20 years um, from like age 30 to age 50. And it's supposed to just sort of be about how, you know, I think when you're young, you expect growing up to be like really exciting. And then the older you get, you realize that it's actually really mundane. Um, and so the book is sort of about like how all of these things that are like, part of your life now probably will be forever, like crappy employers and like uncaring social systems and government. But it's, it's, it's a comedy. So it's like that, <laughs> but like funny. <laughs> There's like gags about like poop and stuff. Um, yeah, and it sort of has like a sort of um, sci-fi element, kind of similar to what you were saying, Carol, about like, it's like looking forwards at like the future of, of climate change particularly is like the metaphor that's used in the book for like everything bad that could happen in the future. And even though it only goes forward 20 years, it like, you know, there's a, there's a section set in LA and it's like underwater and like, mm -hmm. so it's very kind of like heightened in that way. But yeah, it's a, sort of a book about like anxieties about the future meeting the reality of like, the, it'll probably be like a disaster, but like a really boring slow one. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, one question I've got for, for all of you is, is uh, all of you have set stuff up that you're either aging through time or you're going forward in time. How do you, what do you do to go ahead and make differentiations in terms of clothing, mannerisms, backgrounds? Okay, how do you, how do you, what do you do to say, to make this differentiation that here is X on the time scale and then here is Y on the time scale and there's some differentiation that people understand that they're in a future, okay? 
I'll take anybody who wants to go first. Mine go is pretty simple. Uh, so uh, there's a lot of flashbacks in my book. It kind of follows a very classic manga structure of you get dumped into the situation, you get a few chapters in, and only then do you get the big backstory revelation where you go back in time and understand how people arrived in this moment. Uh, and so for me, it was like, it needs to be, I'm both literally on the page, like seeing one time, but visually, I, very boring. Just tweak the character descriptions, like their hair is different, they look younger, their body language is different, they're just getting to know each other, they're so excited, they, and so the, they're both the reader is picking up like, oh, they seem to really like each other here. They didn't like each other in the scene right before this flashback, that's interesting. But also very boring, like very simple, boring stuff, like the hair is long instead of short. Other guy's hair short instead of long. Um, it's very stupid, but it worked really well. Jess? Um, I think uh, for mine, it's just my character wearing a, a shiny bodysuit or not wearing a shiny bodysuit. Very body effective, suit. <laughs> very effective <laughs> honestly. You know I'm time traveled if I'm wearing the shiny bodysuit. <laughs> <laughs> but because it's my own life and my own regrets, I'm mostly going to the past, and so it's mostly. 90s clothes. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say, I'm trying to remember how you drew like teen you. Yeah, uh, yeah. I think uh, I just I, I had really long hair with two blonde streaks in the front. <laughs> so, because <laughs> yeah. my mom would only let me get the two blonde streaks, <laughs> then I could go full blonde when I got older. So that's okay. Well, the blonde streaks are back, so it's true. Yeah, I know. So now no one will be able to tell what time no. period. <laughs> <laughs> but now they're calling it, it a money piece. The money piece, which is funny because it's the opposite. It's the cheap piece, actually. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, sorry. <laughs> now, Luke, for you, because you're you're in essence aging people. It's kind of like Gasoline Alley. Yeah. Okay, in that respect. So, what did, did you know? I, I I read about. I'm sorry. I only got through half your book before I had to come here. And that's okay. Uh, the second half is way better. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what did you do to, to kind of set the place or set the person as as you went as you went through those twenty years? Yeah, well, so the character is it's 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 like a fictionalized version of me, and so it was very fun to sort of draw myself as I kind of might look as I got older. I mean, the way I draw myself is I draw like Nancy, basically. It's like two lines and like a line for the nose. And so it's a very cartoony like, um, you know, depiction. I'm not like really getting into the weeds of like how to draw an older version of myself. But the version that's like 40 year old Luke, I think, or 45 year old Luke. Um, oh yeah, that's the that's LA underwater um, there with like a floating airport. Um, but it was just sort of, I mean, the I basically like, got fatter and got a beard, basically, is like how I, I made that character look older. Did you have a beard when you were drawing this, or did you? No, did you, I, okay, I'm aging I into that. it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it was fun because the book, you know, it takes place in these like, there's four main time periods with then like little snippets between the chapters. So I was like, well, every time period he has to look different. And so in the one that's only like five years in the future, he gets like a corporate job. And so he's like very clean cut and like, you know, like wearing a shirt. And then the next time you see him, he's like a hundred pounds heavier. He has like a broken arm and a huge beard and uh, things haven't like maybe totally gone his way. Mm. Um, but yeah, it's sort of fun. Like that kind of like fiction meets autobiographical thing is like very silly to mess with. Car to Carol, yourself. does your character age or just, is it just the world is changing? The world changes. Um, I use myself as the protagonist and uh, to, make it look age appropriate, I just gave myself gray hair. Um, <laughs> and I use a bodysuit as well. Uh, <laughs> I know because, this is very you know, good. Yeah. who wants to draw all the wrinkles and clothes, you know? Yeah. Um, <laughs> but the, the first uh, step forward is 15 years. And, and I show time differences through the environment. So 15 years from now, um, in the story, to, how many spoilers do we give out That's here? up to you. Yeah, um, that's all. It's your <laughs> thing. Go for it. Spoil everything. It's like authoritarianism, uh, water shortages, people are eating bugs for protein. Uh, there's no more pets because all the Haitian immigrants have eaten them. Um, and um, let me see. It, it's, um, and then uh, for, for the, and everybody's wearing masks because icebergs melting has unleashed a new, you know, wealth of viruses. So, 
And that was great, putting masks on, on the three characters, because then I didn't have to draw all the noses and mouths. This is the most, <laughs> um, this is cartooning, right? I'm so happy right now. Yeah. You've got it figured out. Well, this is my pandemic book. You know, oh. it's like, yeah. um, when the pandemic started, it's like, oh crap, I gotta throw this out. Because I did not envision that in the future of this story. And then I, I listened to a podcast or um, interview with uh, Stephen King by Terry Gross, and he had a similar problem. Oh, I got to throw out this story because I didn't know there was a pandemic coming. And then he said, I just put it away, came back to it later, and incorporated the pandemic and moved along and finished. So that's what I did with this and just kept going. Um, Do you think writing it during the pandemic gave you like a more pessimistic view of the future or was it kind of sad? I think I've always been a pessimist. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, as soon as Trump got in the first time, it's mm -hmm. like, holy shit, we're, we're heading toward the death of democracy. Yeah, rest in and, peace. And, and we're, we're there again and I'm very nervous. And I, I think that, that climate change has um, been the underlying thrum of fear that leads people to go for authoritarians. Mm. Um, you know, it's like we're animals. We're sensing something shitty is happening. But we don't want to talk about it. We want to go on Instagram and talk about makeup or whatever. <laughs> and um, it's, you know, it's very scary to me. But I am lucky in that I am old. And I'm not going to see the worst of it. And I hope for the best for everyone, you know, it's um, it's a scary time. And I put all that fear in here, and I'm not trying to dissuade you from reading the book. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, it's just my tam pandemic baby. Yeah. So. Now, uh, you know, it, it, it's interesting to listen to Carol in particular about this. And Carol, did you read a lot of the underground comics that came out in the 70s? Of course. Okay. Yeah. So, and, and I want to bring something to everybody's attention, all right? Back then, um, it was nuclear or environmental apocalypse. Slow was death was a big title. Slow, like, sl right, slow uh -huh. death was a big one. That what, now granted, all of you were far younger than myself and Carol, but I just want to let you know that this is not the first time we're seeing this, all right? The underground cartoonists circa starting 69, 70 through the mid 70s, back into the late 70s, did a lot of work about what is going to happen either with thermonuclear war or environmental catastrophe. Now, we didn't have pandemics. So it's, it's interesting to see this coming back, but coming back even worse than it was because we were making progress and now that progress is kind of being dissipated as in the case may be. So I, I want to lighten the mood just a little <laughs> bit. Okay. We'll shoot you some knock-knock jokes. So. <laughs> no, no, no. So, and and this, is, this is one that I hope you can have fun with, all right? So I'd, li I'd like for each of you to think about what's your favorite time travel movie, TV show, episode, comic book, you know, piece of pop culture. Now, Carol, I mean, her homage to H.G. Wells in, in her book kind of says something about that, but I'm just curious as to where everybody's head's at that if like, what, it, what is your, I mean, I've got a bunch of my favorites, okay, and I'll talk about mine because you're the panelists. So anyway, so anybody can start, but I, I'm real curious to hear what you have in your, in your pop culture background that may have been an influence on what you're doing. So now. I'll go first to give them time to think. <laughs> <laughs> um, Thank you. Because I'm gonna I'm gonna give an answer that's gonna annoy everybody. Uh, <laughs> so when I was working on this book, definitely like I was a Back to the Future kid, like that. The main character Mariah has a shirt that says 88 miles per hour on it. Like it's very intentional, um, and that's kind of. The way that Back to the Future is actually very sophisticated, especially the original film, very sophisticated in how it's written, and like I really had a big influence on me and in how I think about these kinds of books. But actually, right now, today, years after the, my book came out, I really like the movie Tenet a lot as a time travel mm -hmm. story. I'm with so you. for those of you who I haven't, like too, yeah. so one thing I would say, if you want to watch this movie, you have to watch it with subtitles. Yeah. It is literally mm -hmm. impossible to follow if you don't, because everybody mumbles so much. Yeah. Um, but the, for those of you who haven't seen it, very briefly, the, 
the device, the time travel is basically you can reverse the way that you flow through time like individually. So there's a lot of characters where you'll have one person who's moving and you move at the same pace, which is really key. Like you're not accelerating or decelerating, like you're moving at a subjectively normal pace, but you're just moving backwards through time. And this film is really interested in all the implications of that up to and including like you are in a situation that you are experiencing for the first time, but the people that you're talking with from their subjective experience, they've known you for years because at the end of all this stuff that's happening in this film, this individual character, you're gonna get in this box and sit in it for like some insane amount of time because you're very dedicated to the cause here. And they already met you like 10 years ago or something, but you don't know that because in your, and like, which is a very common thing in time travel, but the, the sort of relentless practicality of, and you have to do it in real time, yeah. you can't just skip, just is very, adds a really interesting kind of tension and um, like poignancy to it and the relationships between the characters and the way that it really emphasizes like these people believe in the cause that they're doing so strongly that they did sit in a goddamn time box for like 10 years or something to do with this, which I think is very cool. Um, but this is the most bro thing about me is how much I like the movie Tenet. <laughs> uh, so anyway, Jess, what about you? <laughs> Um, I also like Tenet. Uh, I just think oh, it's, yeah. we're going to be all for <laughs> you know, Tenet like, just going down, down the line. The line. That's yeah, it. It's Tenet. pretty much the peak. Um, it's just like it did something new with time travel that I hadn't seen before. It was yep. very interesting. Um, but yeah, they do mumble a lot. You really need those. <laughs> <things. Yeah. laughs> that's, that's like the main criticism of the movie. Everybody's like, I can't hear anything anyone is saying. No. Um, subtitles. Yeah, subtitles all the way. Um, I really love... Um, so I also love Back to the Future, Back to the Future Rules. Um, I based my cover for my book on Back to the Future's cover. Um, but um, I think um, I really like, um, there, so one of my favorite authors is Ursula K. Le Guin, and she does a lot of really interesting science fiction stuff. And I, I especially like her short stories. Like, and I, um, she has a, like a, a bunch of like huge short story collections. And one of them, one of my favorite time travel stories is A Fisherman of the Inland Sea. Um, and it's, it's very serious. Um, you know, she's, she's kind of very serious, um, no jokes. But, um, but it's about, it's really about regret. It's kind of about, um, you know, like the, the kind of sliding doors of life. Like what would happen if I went this way versus going that way. And it's uh, about um, a farmer living in this very rural place, um, and they kind of have interests in, in science and in um, you know, learning about how the world works, and they are trying to balance that with also like loving their family life and loving um, living in this, in this you know, kind of beautiful uh, nature um, that they live in. Um, but they, they decide to um, move to the city um, and to become a scientist, and they always wonder if that is um, what they were supposed to do. And it's really just someone wrestling with, um, is, the, is this the right choice? Which I relate to, because I can't make a decision to save my life. <laughs> 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 and so, you know, I think, you know, I don't want to spoil it, but time travel does come into it. Um, but um, it, I think I really like stories where people have to wrestle with these things, where people have to wrestle with, with what is the right decision? What is, what is the right thing to do? Mm -hmm. you know, and maybe there isn't ever a right thing to do. There is just what you do, and that is your life, and, that, and that's fine. There is no right thing. You, just, you just have to learn to accept... Yeah, and that's are. the interesting thing about a lot of time travel stories, I think, is specifically sitting with that feeling of, yes. like, what if I'd made this different choice in different capacities, right? right? It's <laughs> like learning to be comfortable with that regret and that, and that feeling of guilt and that feeling of, oh, I should have done, I should have done better, I could have done better. It's like learning to understand that, like, that's just, that feeling is just part of being human. Like, no one lives without that feeling. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I, really, I really like that story. And there's, there's one other story called Semley's Necklace that's also a time travel story but not in a, in a science fiction way. It's a very like, um, someone from the past is, is being, um, time travel is being done to them. <laughs> they don't know that it's time travel and they're experiencing, experiencing it in a very interesting way. It's really neat, yeah. Mm. Oh, okay, well, hey, 
Thank you. <laughs> Why not? Um, I have maybe like a weird one, I guess, or it's because it's not strictly time travel, but I really love the novel Cloud Atlas by David Mitchell, oh, and yeah. I really I like the film adaptation too, which is I know there's like controversial elements to that film, but I think it's it tells six stories that take place over like hundreds of years, and particularly in the film adaptation, it like cuts back and forth between all, all the time periods like very frequently, um, and you sort of understand maybe how the characters are connected to each other, that kind of thing. But I, I remember I saw that right before I worked on my first comic, and it really blew my mind because I think a big a big issue in, in comics is um, how much work they are, <laughs> um, and how sort of like how undense they can be, right? Like, you know, you want to tell a story um, as succinctly as possible, I think, in comics because it just if you want to tell a really long story, like it just takes so 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 many pages compared to like a novel or something like mm -hmm. that. Um, and what I think that film does amazingly is it's really, it just has a very, very strong use of like juxtaposition. Mm -hmm. um, it's just about giving you like two events beside each other and like letting your mind kind of like make the connections. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really handy in comics because sort of taking advantage of that juxtaposition of like different um, time periods or um, simultaneous stories taking place in different uh, locations, I think it really makes comics feel longer than they are. It like makes it feel more full because it lets the reader's mind kind of like fill in everything in between. Um, so I really, I really like that film. I don't love that it has like weird yellow face in it. Um, so I'm anti that. Um, to be clear, <laughs> that's on the record, um, Your Honor. Okay. <laughs> um, that and I love Slaughterhouse Five. Mm -hmm. That's such a great yeah. book. Yeah. Um, which is again kind of like a unstuck from time thing. It's like it's sort of time travel, but not really. It's just about like presenting different moments from this character's life, like next to each other, and like seeing what that means to the reader. Mm -hmm. I don't know yeah. if you're doing this on purpose, but I love that all the stuff you're saying directly feeds into how you've described your own book. Like, yeah. oh yeah, I can it's see why you would then make this yeah. comic. That it's makes available sense. at the Drawn and Quarterly booth. <laughs> <laughs> Please purchase it. I'll be signing right after this panel. <laughs> How about you, Carol? Uh, before I came out, I wanted to review all these time travel stories I love. Like, mm. um, you know, just read Slaughterhouse Five again, or Sound of Thunder by Bradbury, or uh, Martian Time Slip by Phil Dick. But instead, I ran out of time. But there was a time travel movie on the plane coming over. Oh. <laughs> and it was called a, It was called About Time. And I read the oh, description. It. It's oh. really good. I yeah. know. I thought I was going to hate it? it because it was like, oh, here's this little sexist gimmick of only the men in the family can travel back in time to right. fix their shit. Mm -hmm. So um, I haven't heard of this about time. About time. Yeah. And, like little and <laughs> I ended up like crying and laughing, <laughs> and and it was I loved it because. No, I won't give a spoiler about how it ends, but it's um, it's well worth looking at. Mm -hmm. It's it's totally fantasy, you know, in that uh, there's no machine involved. It's um, but all time travel stories are fantasy because it's impossible, and it's just a matter of degree. Like, do you need a machine? Do you do it internally, or does it happen from an outside force, etc. Let me see, any other? But I, I do uh, talk about um, time, the time machine, Wells' uh, you know, fiction, as if it were real, and then George Powell's movie in the late 60s, as if it were a documentary. Mm. Oh, that's um, fun. That's great. And I ignored the remake of, of the time machine because it was garbage. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I agree, I like the original <laughs> film. Yeah, but my, I put it in here. Um, my dad took me and my three older sisters to, to the movies on a Saturday mm. to see The Time Machine. And then when the Morlock was dissolving, oh, at the end as, as he's moving, he thought that was just too much for that little eight-year-old mm. Carol. So he dragged us all out of the theater, and I didn't get to see the ending for no. years. <laughs> I know. I had a good dad. <laughs> Now, there, there's one that, that I don't know if a lot of people know. Do you know about the German TV series Dark? No. no. Okay, so Dark is really interesting. It's kind of leading to my next question. What they basically do with Dark is, is they, they basically take away some of these constraints that pop culture sometimes puts on time travel, like you cannot meet yourself mm. in the past, okay? And it's, it's, a it's one of the best time travel things I've seen in a long time, and 
I've been watching stuff on TV, like Mirror Mirror, okay, going into a different universe, um, Star Trek going back in time, stuff like that. But definitely check out Dark because it, it takes some of these tropes that you know a lot of people are aware of and put constraints on time travel and basically throw them all out. Mm. All right, hmm. and so I, I, I highly I highly recommend this. So so on this, there are there are some, I guess, alleged rules that one kind of runs across when you when you read science fiction or you watch it or however you absorb that particular um, style of writing. And I'm just curious as to what your opinions are about those kinds of constraints. Basically, you know, you can't go back the butterfly effect. There are there are all of these things that have been kind of posited in both in literature and in movies and science, movies and TV shows that I, I'm just curious as to what you feel about those things and how you've, you maybe did or did not cope with them in your relative books. So I, um, one of the things I do for professionals, I also edit comics, so I have to think a lot. I'm coming, this, I'm gonna answer the question I'm setting up. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> time. I also time. edit comics, and I think a big thing in comics editorials, as you said, it, it takes a really long time to draw a comic, so there's a certain sense of, like, if you think about what am I trying to accomplish, or what is the author trying to accomplish with this, like, what's important, and then all decisions get made versus that. Like, is this a book where I need to be really nitpicky about every single detail? Or can it be like, it doesn't matter if his hat disappears between panels, literally nobody cares. It's fine, you don't need to redraw that, right? And I think that that approach of like, think about what your end goal here is, is super applicable to time travel stories because I think the constraints are mostly there to help you understand the stakes and help you, like, the, the point of the constraints is to give your character, like, context and, like, boundaries and to give your story context and boundaries. So I feel like sometimes you can get a little lost in the weeds of, like, as you say, like, the rules of time travel, but as you, we've been talking about, in some cases where the mechanics and the particulars are really important, then, yeah, you should probably lean a little bit more into the science fictional aspects. Like, in my book, it specifically is talking about multiple timelines and how small, like, butterfly effect type stuff and the, the very particular mechanics of how the time travel works are really important to the characters making choices about what they want to do, right? But if it's something where it's more like an emotional time travel story, where, like, yours is much more like this, where it's, like, much more about this person's, your own relationship with your own past self and regret and whatnot, the mechanics completely do not matter at all. And if you'd spent a bunch of time talking about the mechanics in your book, it would have been, like, why are you making yourself draw this? Yeah. Like, this does not matter at all. You could have spent these pages making more jokes mm -hmm. about dumb shit, and mm -hmm. you would have been happier. And so I feel like that's, like, really not getting lost in the weeds and thinking primarily about, like, what is what am I actually trying to accomplish here? And putting as few rules as possible to take take it out, keep taking stuff out until you start to lose clarity and focus and like stakes, and that's where you stop. That and my, that's my approach anyway. Now I was the other way because I like exploring uh, what would happen vis-a-vis uh, -vis the butterfly effect. Yeah. Because you know it would definitely happen if you went in the past. But it would also happen if you go into the future, mm -hmm. because then you're going into the future in which you were not around that might have made some small change that affects something larger and you know cascading. Mm -hmm. um, so I I played around with you know the metaphysics of time travel, and one of the ways that I mean H. G. Wells uh, he wrote his thing in 1895. So he was obviously into Darwin and evolution, um, and that's what he had explored in that, in that novelette, was what's gonna, how are humans going to evolve by the year 701, 802, or whatever it is. And he had them dividing into the Morlocks and the Eloi, and uh, one is a predator and the other is just prey. So... Um, I was more interested in the evolution of the Earth, um, and I'm getting off track here. But his um, advance in the time was totally off. You know, it's like he he had a scientific basis, but he doesn't have the knowledge that we have. Mm -hmm. So he's got, you know, all this um, impossible things happen. 30 million years from now. And I just 
went back, you know, because I was treating the time uh, machine as real, I explained how he screwed things up. <laughs> and, and it's like, when you move forward into time, you start hallucinating. Mm. And that will, um, you know, skew your, your, what you're seeing, what you're knowing, and is this even real? So I got to play around with hallucinogenic effects you know, just drawing on my use of LSD back in college. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, Did you think about somebody reading the book, like if, like somebody reading your book in the future with like the scientific knowledge they have then, of being like, what did she know? Like, Oh yeah, okay. yeah, this is gonna be totally bogus in a few years. Yeah, <laughs> but that's all of our fates, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, how about you, Jess? Uh, yeah, I, well, I think you, you kind of yeah nailed it. I think it's it's the um, uh, yeah. It depends on what you're trying to say with your story. I think it, what your goal is with your story, and I think I, I can be very picky when I'm watching um, like hard science fiction movies. Like I, I do get very picky about the rules and like when someone's breaking them. But when something is a comedy, suddenly I don't care. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> suddenly I'm like, oh, okay, I don't care. Yeah, Hot that, tub that's time machine completely. <laughs> right. uh, anything goes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm like, sure, that can show up there. I don't, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> like as long as it's funny, go ahead. I think um, it, it's just a shifting of the the goals of the thing. If if it if it is achieving its goal of being funny, or if it's uh, achieving its goal of um, you know, uh, making the point it wants to make. Well, it's uh, like you have Tenet on one end in terms of the time travel mechanics are mechanics. so important and so serious and whatever. On the other hand, you have like Bill and Ted. Right, Where right, it's like right. time travel is not right. not important, but mm -hmm. don't, don't, they're in a phone booth. Don't worry about it. It's right. fine. Right, <laughs> yeah. They're, they're using it as like a pastiche, as like a, as a, as a way to... They get, want Joan of Arc to be here, so then... Right, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think Bill and Ted was based on Doctor Who? Uh, gotta be. I had right? not thought about that until just now, but probably, surely, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah, it's like that's the Bongos. American version of yeah. Doctor Who. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Something I just because you brought up Doctor Who, I <laughs> have been, sorry, I've been rewatching the the first season of the like rebooted Doctor Who from two thousand and five, mm. and something I love about that um, series is it's so. Um, it uses this idea of time travel and like space travel really to talk about the character of Rose. It's just, yeah. it's all about her learning her place in the world because she comes from a council estate and she's been told her whole life, like there's nothing more for you. Like nobody has any expectations of her. And the first thing that they do is they go to the end of the world, like the mm. destruction of the world. Yeah. And it's just saying like, hey, like nobody matters. Like mm. don't worry about it. And every episode is just investigating like who she, can be in the world, basically. And it's sort of the whole message of that series is like, nobody matters that much, so like you really matter as much as anybody else. And mm. I think that is a real good use of like it, time travel to tell like an emotional story. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, love it. Yeah. <laughs> now, now, now on this, so what do you think is harder or more interesting to you, backwards or forwards? Uh, staying still. No, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think, it, well, I think, you know, like writing about, writing about like the past or the future is, I think it's all about processing your own feelings about it really, or to, to me it is, like when I, when I, because I've written like memoir that like looks back on, on my youth and then I've written this book that's like kind of imagining the future. And I think it is, it's all about like processing where you are now, I guess. Like the, the, this, this book that I just did, like I did it during the pandemic as well. And so it's a book that it's ostensibly, like in a literal sense, it's about climate change, but really like climate change stands in for like any anxieties about the future. Um, and a lot of it is really about, about COVID. Um, and so I think like either way, we're so like trapped in our context of now that I, I think it's the same. But sorry, that's like a kind of a cop out answer. No, no, that's yeah. okay. And anybody else? Well, I think it's like, um, for me, like my book is literally historical fiction. And so I spent a lot of time researching that because of the, the nature of the specific book. Like I, it's a science fiction story, it's, it's gonna be silly, but I wanted it to at least feel like I was being respectful of the period that it was set in. Um, but on the other hand, it's interesting, like just for your book, like did you feel like you were writing historical fiction about yourself? Like how much were you like actually trying to base it on your own past life? Like, you know, for instance, like there's Reyna, where the reason she can do 
her books the way that she does because she kept journals when she was a kid. Right, so right, she has right, like right, a very right, right. like complete knowledge of mm -hmm. like her inner life as a 12 year old or something huh. that I certainly do not have. Mm. Uh, so like when you were writing your own, because I think that that's the thing when you're writing in the past, it's kind of like how much freedom do you have to just mm. sort of make stuff up versus mm -hmm. like, no, there's a specificity to this that is important to the story. Mm. Um, I think like uh, everything in the We Can Fix It is like as true and real as I can possibly make it. Like they're real thoughts that I have had. And they're, and they're just like, you know, uh, like the, the me that is time traveling in that book is wrong and an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> and and I think that you know the the it it is um, easier for me to write about that stuff obviously because I'm here in the future I can you know look back on it with 2020 vision and so I think it um, it, it it makes more sense for me to to write about the past I think writing about the future is really daunting and scares me um, you know and I and it and it it should right but um, yeah it's hard. Yeah. I think that, um, I mean, I would love to have a time machine and go back and tell myself not to do this or, this or that. So, like Jess said, going into the past is trying to fix problems or deal with regrets. Going into the future is dealing with fear. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, that was my main concern and that's where I, why I went into the future. Now, one of the things that, that's come about, and this is, you know, we here in the indie comics world look at time travel, things like that, on a very different basis than the superhero world. And one of the <laughs> things that is interesting to me, and I want to get your reaction to this, is all of this multiverse stuff mm -hmm. that when you peel it away is really just alternative timelines mm -hmm. mm -hmm. that just coexist at one, at one time. And I'm just curious to what your opinions are of that particular now trope. I don't read capes <laughs> and flying people, so I'll pass. Well, I, I historically, like as a young person especially, I really was interested in kind of the idea of like multiverse and multi versions of reality, not coming from a comics background at the time, but more from like books and film and television. Uh, and so that's, that's actually like very like, like, that is like the plot of my uh, book from the time travel, that the science fiction plot is essentially that somebody has intentionally split off uh, to another, t sorry, this is just boring science fiction stuff, but basically yeah. what's mechanically happening in this book is that this, the main character has been trapped in the past, and when she finally gets back her little time machine device that's supposed to click the button and she goes back to the future, it doesn't work. And the reason it doesn't work is because, unbeknownst to her, someone else has also been, uh, there's, a, there's an unknown extra time traveler she's not aware of, who has begun changing the past and it has disconnected her from her own mm -hmm. future. Like she's been shunted into another timeline where if she just kept living out her natural life, it would move further and further away from the version of history that she was here to study. Uh, and so the plot is basically about like sufficiently course correcting to kind of, it's gonna be different, but it's close enough that it kind of merges back with the river, if that makes any sense. Yeah, sure. uh, so I clearly, I just think that's really interesting and I think it's especially interesting the idea of um, the wobbliness of it, like what's close enough? Like mm. how, what, how far apart is you're now in a different universe versus like, it, the Back to the Future films are like this, like when Marty comes back home again, his parents are wealthy and had a completely different childhood mm -hmm. and he's like, he's still himself, so he was able to get back there and it's home, but it's like forever changed because of the things that have happened to him. Yeah. That is really interesting, I think that specifically really stuck with me as a kid. Mm -hmm. That's very interesting to me, like what's, where's, how much wiggle room is there in the way that you're setting up the concept of time travel? Mm -hmm. um, and like what counts as home for you to get kind of like thematic about it? Like how, how much does it have to be like your own memory of something to be like, ah, oh, that's close enough. Did you ever watch Sliders? Oh yeah. 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 Sliders. yeah, sliders. Yeah, that's wow. where that just really reminded me of it because their whole thing is they're trying to get back to their home universe or whatever. Mm -hmm. And they keep every episode is basically them saying, Well, is this one good enough? Like should we just stop? Do they ever slide home? Did they did well, they slide? It's heartbreaking. The yeah. last episode. Yeah. I mean I the haven't watched gate. the whole thing. <laughs> the swinging gate. Oh, it uh, keeps me up at uh, night. Uh, <laughs> uh, listen, listen. Um, science fiction peaked with sliders, the sci-fi <laughs> channel original. 
But yeah, watch, watch. You only have to watch forty episodes to get to the swinging gate, so you'll know it's mm-hmm. worth it. There yeah. you go. <laughs> yeah. I, I did like. I watched the Loki show, and I, I like the Loki show. I don't. I don't really. I don't read um, superhero stuff much, but I do. Uh, I thought that show was fun. It had. It had good jokes. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Well, yeah, fun time and, travel. And uh, you know. Almost all the Star Trek series always oh, had yeah. time Oh, yeah. Oh, Mirror the Universe stuff is fun. Yeah. Well, I, I love the whale movie. I think that's my favorite Star Trek movie of yeah. all time. Yeah, right. The movie <laughs> where they go get the whale. Hmm. That I, the Voyage I love Home. It. The Voyage Home. Right. I love The Voyage Home. And that's a great time travel movie. Yeah. Well, Mirror Universe Kira from Deep Space Nine made me gay. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, I think she made a lot of people gay. Yeah, <laughs> damn. She made yeah. everybody in the Mirror Universe gay. She too. made her <laughs> regular universe self gay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Anyway, sorry. That's 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 a whole other thing. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, might as well. Might as well open up some any questions out there. No. Yes. So when you were writing your books, or, or, or you know, creating your books, maybe that's a better description of the process here. Were there any points when you realized you had written yourself into a corner? And how did you get yourself out? What was the corner that you wrote yourself into? I, mean, I think you touched on this a yeah. little bit, but that was kind of an external event with COVID. But but I think that Carol, what Carol talked about is actually a perfect example of how to deal with both of these things, which okay. is you have this panic moment of like, oh no, I have realized that I accidentally, usually it's that you accidentally imply something you didn't mean to or you run into some kind of like logic problem, like this character has no reason to do this, or it's usually something like that because you were so focused on one thing you just weren't thinking about it, and the answer is almost always to like put it down for a little while and then maybe talk to a friend about it for a couple of hours. Because hmm. um, usually the problem is that you're so locked into what you originally intended to do that you can't see the solution. And most of us, I think we're capable writers, like the solution is there, but you have to let go of your original idea of what it was supposed to be. And sometimes that just means time and distance. But I'm curious if you, you had uh, other specifics that you guys want to talk about, about that kind of thing. Um, I wrote the ending of my book first. Mm. Or like, oh, you're one of those. Yeah, and I drew, <laughs> I drew the last chapter before I drew anything else. Wow. Um, How'd that work out? Yeah, really fun. <laughs> 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 I love it. And it's available at the Drawn and Quarterly booth. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I, I liked it because that was the part that takes place the furthest in the future. And so it's kind of like... Um, the, it's it's the weirdest part of the book, and everything else is kind of like moving up to that. But I'm a much, like as a writer, I'm a much more like if it flows, it goes kind of person. Like I'm not too worried about like things making sense. I think I got really turned off like like book logic when I was like reading Crack.com in like 2008, and just like people <laughs> crit- being like, well, in Back to the Future, this doesn't make sense. I'm mm-hmm. like, who cares? Like yeah. nothing matters. We're all gonna die. Like, <laughs> relax. <laughs> like, um, but yeah, I think like. It, for me, it's more fun to just like, if it feels right, it is right, basically, mm. and, and yeah, not not worry too much about it. Yeah. I got stumped by timeline. Uh, my, you know, first writing on it was pretty chronological, and a uh, friend read it and just helped me get to shaking it up with a framing device. You know, I I start in the far, far future, and then it's like, here's how I got here, and, you know, what do I do now? So it, it I had to just explode the thing and put it back together a couple of times. But I didn't have any blocks except for the pandemic thing, and then that was, um, you know, after I put it aside for three months, it was good to go back and just you got to throw out your darlings sometimes yeah. and just, you know, take a new approach. That's a great thing because I think that people get the kill your darlings thing. They take it very literally. Yeah, Either you yeah. literally have to kill a character you like yeah. or, like, if you like something too much, that's bad. But I feel like mostly it's, like, you're really attached to something that's keeping you from moving forward. Mm. Like, in recognizing, like, oh, like, this is a stone in the river for me that's, like, b- making all the twigs stop and if I take this out even though I like it it's beautiful rock it, the rock has to go because it's yeah 
Yeah, you can keep it and save it for something else. If you really like yeah. the writing in it, you know, maybe you can use that little nugget of an idea for something else. But yeah, you. I like having the other Google Doc where you lie to yourself and tell you that I'm definitely going to use this later. <laughs> yeah. You just copy the yeah. 3,000 words and you put it over there. You're like, this you is for later. And then you never read it you again. You got to placate yourself a little bit. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm going to add um, one thing that I did in an early stage was uh, rely too much on. Uh, memoirish kind of stories and then I have action adventure in other parts of the stories and my early reader you know said hey make a decision is this a memoir or science fiction action adventure and I decided to go with action adventure Hell yeah. so mm -hmm. you know it's um, you know just a choice I made mm -hmm. any other questions yes oh we're good to go? Okay. Any other final comments on time travel across pop culture or any great Fanographics. <laughs> uh, it stinks. Don't do time travel stories. No, I don't know. No. Um, I, I, well, I... I I, I feel like I, I want to correct something I said, or like earlier I was just like, oh, making comics is so hard, but I, and I, I feel like I've heard that on like a few panels and like it's great that everybody gets together and commiserates about how making comics is hard, but it's also so fun and great. And yeah, yeah I just wanted to like chip that in there. Like it's the best, so yeah. Yeah, it, yeah comics do rule. Yeah, yeah. it's like, <laughs> great. It's There's great to read them, here. it's great to make them. Yeah. 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 yeah, it's fun to make your own little movie. Yeah. It, it is very hard work. It's yeah. hard. But it is, it's fun to make your own it's like the control freak medium, though, I think. Yes, it's like absolutely. you get to do exactly yeah. whatever you want. The, yeah, the yeah. character design, yeah. the clothes, the environment design, just, yeah. yeah but I think all. it's an argument to only make comics that you're, like, really insane about. Absolutely. Like, unless yeah. somebody's paying you a lot of money, yeah. like, make the comic that makes you into a lunatic, because mm -hmm. it's so much work. What are you doing mm -hmm. if you're making a comic that you don't care that much about? Yeah, like, you got to be obsessed. Be yeah. crazy. Like, be a crazy person. Um, I became an absolute crazy. I wor It took me 15 years to draw a Cronin on and off, because mm -hmm. I'm stupid and made bad choices in my life. Because it it's like 700 something pages long. Mm -hmm. But like on the other hand, like I, I did it, man. Yeah. Uh, and I was mostly in conversation with what my 25 year old self thought was really cool. But that was also really interesting. Mm -hmm. um, also, so I'm, I'm at uh, table age, <laughs> age, <laughs> age four. Come see me. Um, but also specifically to, to this thing, I guess my final thought would be like, I think that comics are a really great medium for time. It's so unique and so different than how time works in prose. I think it's really fun to play with, and I really encourage people who are maybe coming from more a prose writing background to really think about uh, passage of time, and not just like the montage thing, but like there's ways that prose lets you skip over big chunks of time that's very different than comics. Mm -hmm. And I think really thinking about how you can handle time, both literally in a time travel sense, but also just like, how do you describe somebody's summer vacation in comics? Mm -hmm. Very different than how you would in prose. How do you capture that feeling that would be a 3,000 word block of just mostly prose description as comics? Like, that's a very cool problem, and I, I, I'd enjoy trying to solve it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, and I think that's it. Thank you oh, very much. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh, I, I'm at A6, uh, and uh, my books are also at the Top Shelf booth. Uh, I'm at H4. Um, yep. H is happy. I'm so happy to be here. <laughs> um, and I do have Cronin, which is only me at this point, because it's out of print. Uh, four. I'll be signing books at the Fanographic It's booth. at W51 to 55. Thank you. Um, and I don't think, yeah, I don't think I had mentioned it, but I will be at the Drawn and Quarterly booth <laughs> um, uh, right after this, yeah. Um, and I don't know what number it is, but they're in the, when you come in, it's on the very, very left yeah, in the corner. You go, you go to the far left. Okay, great. Yes. Thank you. Like, what so WA8? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Right. Thank you, oh, Warren. I'm sorry, one oh. more. Wait a minute. I will let Rob and the programming team know about that. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, thank right. you, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, thank you Warren. Thank you.